Hey, good morning, Men's Prayer Ministry at Christ United Methodist Church in Memphis. I'm honored to be with you today. My name is Jody Hill. I am the president of Memphis Theological Seminary, your neighbor just up the street. And uh, just a little bit about myself, I had served as a vice president for community relations at Blue Mountain College, a little Christian college in North Mississippi owned by the Southern Baptist Convention, Mississippi Baptist Convention, uh, down in Mississippi and have grew up in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church as a pastor. That's uh, the whosoever will of Presbyterian. So uh, grew out of the revival meetings on the American frontier in the early 1800s and I've served in churches as a pastor and bivocational pastor of Cumberland Presbyterian, Presbyterian congregations of all types throughout the year and uh, continue to grow in my ministry of education. So just began here in January at Memphis. Honored to be with you, you all and grateful for Mike Weaver asking me to share a word with y'all today. So uh, the scripture I'm going to share is from the Gospel of Mark in chapter Four, and the reading will start with verse 35. I had it pulled up a few minutes ago and, and just lost it again. But let's, uh, let's turn here uh, to Mark chapter 4, if you want to follow along in your Bible, beginning with verse 35. And uh, we'll continue down through the remainder of the chapter. So as we prepare together to hear God's word, let us approach uh, that royal throne of grace through prayer. Will you pray with me? Oh God, we, in our tradition of worship, often call this a prayer for illumination. It's our request, God, that you light the path for us, that you open our eyes and help us to see. For your scripture tells us, O oh Lord, that you are the light of the world. We also ask, O oh God, that you not only give us eyes to see, but ears to hear. For we also hear in your holy word that you are the word made flesh. And finally, O oh God, not only do we want eyes to see and ears to hear, but hearts to receive. For your gospel, O oh God, is the wellspring of life. So come, O oh Holy Spirit, open us to your word that we may receive and be molded more in your image for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So a reading here from the Gospel of Mark in chapter 4, beginning with verse 35. That day when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats around him. And a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are about to drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you, not, do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. May the Lord's blessing be upon this holy reading. You know, in many ways, I know we are all tiring of talking about the coronavirus. So in some ways today, as we reflect on this scripture, rather than focus upon the virus, the impact upon the pandemic, what I really want to listen to with fresh ears from this text today is focusing on where God is in the midst of this storm. But you see, that's how it's been described by many of us. Recently, I was asked to show a uh, video, a message of hope for Local 24 in Memphis. And in that message, I shared how in this time of sickness and separation, for many of us, it seems as though there's a cloud of darkness over us. But we are encouraged to be people of light 
in the midst of that darkness. As it was said once of Eleanor Roosevelt, she was an inspiration to so many because instead of cursing the darkness that was around her, she was inspired to light a candle. So friends, in the midst of the storm we're going through, I think there may be words for us of hope, of inspiration, of even comfort about where our God is and what's going on in the midst of the storm, whether it be coronavirus, family troubles, professional problems that we're dealing with. Where is God when we're challenged and in crisis? In our text that we shared a few minutes ago, I want us to imagine, if we can visualize what's happening, our scripture tells us that Jesus is on the Sea of Galilee, and he's preaching, and there's other boats, and in the midst of this great revivalistic ministry where people are coming to him, finding healing and wholeness, restoration, deliverance from their illness and their personal crisis, also, they're being reconnected with loved ones. Their social distancing has been overcome because their illnesses that kept them separated, they can now be restored. And in the midst of this, we hear some very troubling words. Jesus says, let's go to the other side. Now, in that passage where Jesus says, let's go to the other side, Imagine with me, if there are hundreds, maybe even a thousand people on the shore of Galilee who've come seeking, who've come searching for hope, restoration, and deliverance. Imagine their response when Jesus says to his disciples, let's go from here. There's other work to be done. You know, put it from a personal perspective. If you or I had taken off work that day, we journeyed with our family or by ourselves. We'd taken a cut and pay. We were hungry and needing and hurting. And we went to this one person who we heard could bring deliverance. And when we arrive, he said, let's go to the other side. Raises questions for us, doesn't it? Why? Why would Jesus get on the sea when there was trouble right before him? Why would he allow those who were facing the storm to go into the storm with him as well? You see, that's the other part of this question. Because as we embrace Scripture, and as those real smart people called theologians say to us, our God is omniscient, meaning our God is all-knowing. And if we embrace in our Christian heritage fully that Jesus was fully God and fully human, then Jesus, friends, also knew that when he got on the water that day, a storm was a coming. And that raises for me the question, why would our Lord, why would our Lord get onto the ocean if he knew their very lives would be challenged and that they would potentially face destruction? Why would our God not only go into the storm, but yes, take his friends, his disciples, allow them to endure the waves as well? Friends, I think that if we have questions about that. We're no different from the disciples. Did you hear their response? I'm grateful for their response. I celebrate that they too were fragile in their faith at times and asked because did you hear how they responded when the waves began crashing in and the storm was upon them? They very aggressively said, Lord, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Now, can we be honest? Can we really be honest and wrestle with the text today and say, haven't we all uttered those words at times? God, do you not care? Lord, I've 
I've put my trust in you. I, I hope in you. I'm a Christian. I pay my taxes. I take care of my family. I do what I should do. Why would you allow this storm upon me? And if we expand it further, why would you allow our world to be engulfed with such a challenging state? Our economy turned upside down beyond the physical illness and loss of life. Why, oh God, would you allow this storm? We all can wrestle with that question like the disciples in our text today. So what can the disciples teach us in their response? And more importantly, where do we say God's grace in this storm? You know, as I wrestle with that question of why God would allow the disciples to go into the storm knowing that a storm was coming, I think of our motto at Memphis Theological Seminary, we like to say that we educate and equip ministers, prepare them to serve God's church by preparing their head, their heart, and their hand. And I think in this text today, Jesus is teaching the disciples and even us today how to grow in those attributes as we seek to be his church and respond to the storms of life. Here's what I mean. Do you hear in our text today when they face the storm? Let's imagine if we were fishermen in the first century world, and if we were fishermen in the first century world, when we went through storms, when waters crashed in upon our vessel, our boat, we learned something. It helped us grow in our head knowledge. Have you ever thought of that? How would we know where the, weak saw, the leaks are in our vessel unless we go through trying and storms and water crashing upon us at times? You see, that's what good fishermen learn. By going through the storms, they grow in their head knowledge to be able to deal with other storms of life. Could it be? Part of the storm for the disciples and the storms that we face, God uses to grow us, to become stronger and love our God with all of our mind and soul. But you know what else is happening? Not only are the disciples growing in their head knowledge about their vessel and about their friend and their Lord, they're also growing in their hand knowledge in their strength, in their ability to serve and be Christ to the world around them, to live out his love and proclaim his glory and gospel. You see, when we think of athletes, as I've been watching some of the dynasty of the last dance of the Chicago Bulls, and I looked at Michael Jordan's intense practice regimen where he pushed himself beyond belief to be stronger and faster and more physically fit than anyone he faced. We who've participated in athletics or seen our kids or friends or loved ones do so, we understand that the more we work those muscles, the more we strengthen them, the more we're able to withstand and enhance our performance and our sense of joy and fullness in whatever we're competing in, correct? You see, the disciples going through this storm, not only did they grow in their head knowledge, but they were strengthened in their hands to serve the world. By going through adversity, much like an athlete who's trained and gone through intense preparation and sacrifice and felt the pain and grew stronger so that they would be more well equipped when future storms were upon them. But you know, I think there's one other message that the disciples demonstrate to us and Jesus teaches us that not only by going through storms are we smarter and grow in our capacity to love God with our mind and grow in our capacity to love God in our strength, but in the words of Scripture where our God says, love me also with all of your heart and soul. You see, ultimately, friends, 
I think the disciples grew in this day in their heart knowledge. You see, Jesus asked the question. Did you hear it in our text? Near the very end of our passage, when they had questioned him why he would allow the storm to come, did he not care that they were facing utter destruction in their life, in their family, in their profession? He said this, Have you still no faith? See, friends, I think this experience for the disciples was a time for them to grow in their heart knowledge, in their faith, in their trust in Jesus to sustain them no matter what storms they face. So friends, in some ways today, in ways that I can't even explain, I'm grateful for the storms that I've gone through in life, not that I celebrate them while I'm in them, and not that I want to sign up for them again. But in looking back, after the storm, I see where my faith, my dependence, my trust in Jesus Christ as Lord to sustain me and overcome and bring light even in the darkness and love that never ends. So may we continue to pray daily. May we, as disciples of Jesus, as we're facing this current storm and any storm or crisis that plagues us, continue like the disciples to be people of prayer. You see, that's what's happening in our text today. When they cry out, Lord, do you not care? They're asking God. They're petitioning God. They're searching for God to sustain them and strengthen them. And I say to you, church, and people seeking strength and comfort in your storm, don't stop asking. Don't stop knocking. Don't stop searching, for Jesus our Lord is ever more willing to hear and answer than we are to even ask and seek. So know that God is with us in this storm and in every storm for his glory and through his love and for the joy that we're called to share with the world around us. May we be his light in this time of darkness. God bless you. Amen.